Right, so today I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, the art of DRS the, uh, and the environments of the game and how the uh, environments are an important part of the storytelling process of the game. But I think the first thing I should really do is just kind of go over the concept of DRS the, and some of the history behind it and its origins, just so that you can get a better idea of why the environments are such an important part of the storytelling process of the game. Um, so, DRS has started out life uh, as a source engine mod in 2008 and was originally conceived by, by Dan Pinchbeck as a, um, an experiment to see what would happen if you uh, stripped out traditional gameplay from a first person game space and instead just try to use that space to do something different uh, outside of the normal traditions of gameplay. Um, and in this case, it was just designed to see if you could uh, use that space to tell like a deep, ambiguous story about a, a dying man stranded on a Hebridean island um, coming to terms with a tragic loss. And to kind of tell this story just through exploring the environment and being absorbed in the, in the, the story itself. Um, and as a research project, it actually did pretty well. It got released and it got 50,000 downloads within the first six months, and um, it gained quite a cult following in the modding scene, and it's kind of around this time that I stumbled across it myself, and um, although I found it really captivating, really inspiring, I couldn't help but it wasn't, feel that it wasn't quite fulfilling its true potential, especially being built upon this idea that it's uh, around exploring the environments and telling a story through the environments. Um, so... In the original mod, you had this fantastically engaging voiceover narrative that plays as you explore throughout the island and um, that not only gives you glimpses into the protagonist's past and his reasons for being on the island, but more importantly, more interestingly for me, was that it gives you all these glimpses into the history of the island itself and its past inhabitants and all the various plagues and misfortunes that have, that have plagued them throughout the history of the island. And... Um, for me, this is, the, this is the most interesting part of the, the experience because all of these little bits of information that were coming through in the voice narrative were really helping me to build this world in which the story takes place. Um, but the problem I saw with the original mod was that this kind of visual detail that was coming through, the, this audio detail that was coming through the narrative really wasn't being represented with the environments. Uh, and as a result, there was this kind of real disconnection between the visual experience and the auditory experience. Um, and as an environment artist, I kind of felt really drawn to this project because I felt that, you know, I had this theory for a while that, you know, the backdrop, that the environments of the games shouldn't just be just a backdrop, a passive thing in which a game takes place. And here I saw a great opportunity to make the, back, make the environments more of a backdrop uh, and make it like an immersion tank to really draw the player in and make it an integral part of the storytelling process. Um, and today I'm just going to take you through some of the processes that I went through uh, in order to achieve this and also some of the philosophies and some of the lessons that I learned along the way. Um, and I think one of the most important lessons that I learned that really sort of made an impact on me as an artist and the project in general was early on when I was kind of wrestling with the idea of how I was going to create this really immersive world. Um, and I kind of started out into the slightly naive belief that, you know, in order to achieve realism, in order to achieve immersion, you needed to be as realistic as possible. You needed to create this, like, really believable world. Um, and at the time, I was working with the Source Engine. And as some of you may or may not know, it's, it's not particularly designed to work with large outdoor environments. And as a result, I kind of ended up having to cut out any normal maps, any fancy shading, and it went straight back to only being able to use diffuse maps on the textures. Um, and as a result, in some of the early art tests, which you can see here, the terrain just looked really flat and unconvincing, and just it became quickly apparent that realism just wasn't going to happen. Um, and in retrospect, this is probably one of the best things that happened to the project and myself as an artist, because it really forced me to go back to the drawing board and kind of reassess what this idea was, what really made immersion and what the qualities were that made immersion. Um, and I kind of started looking into other mediums and more, more uh, prominently paintings and just trying to get some inspiration and see, see if this, this kind of immersive quality was evident anywhere else. And um, I started to be drawn towards this kind of impressionistic style of painting 
Um, there was just something about it. It was something about this mix of the real and the surreal, this detail and perceived detail that you see in some of these paintings that I thought really mirrored sort of Dear Esther's uh, strange and ambiguous story. Um, but not only that, I found some of these paintings like so atmospheric, so uh, immersive and so, so absorbive um, that I, I really just felt inspired to kind of take, just, just to study these images and try and take some of the qualities that made these, uh, made these images, even though they're not representations of photo reality, um, and adapt that into my work, see if I could create this kind of immersive quality in it. So the first thing I tried to do is just kind of identify some of what I thought were the key qualities of this impressionistic style. And for me, it was kind of this really strong sense of lighting that kind of creates the atmosphere in some of these paintings, these kind of like soft colors, this like really soft lighting. And I really like this idea of evoking emotion over recreating reality. So only creating enough detail and enough fidelity within the image to kind of bring across the, the impression of that scene, the emotion of that scene. And I also like the idea of using the color palette to reinforce this kind of emotional quality and get this, the atmosphere and mood just through the colors and the, uh, and the, of the picture. Um, so I went back to my original art test and I tried to adapt some of these qualities into my work and just tried to make it a lot more softer and I made the lighting more ambient and just, just I kind of embraced this kind of flatness that was there before and tried to make it a lot more painterly in style. And already it was starting to come together and look a lot more of a beautiful, interesting place to explore. And this kind of really inspired me to, to continue on later on in the level in the development when <clears throat> I realized that breaking three of these boundaries of this realism really allowed me to play with the, uh, some of the designs of the island and the colors and the... And the, the the kind of symbolic uh, uh, imagery that's in there, <clears throat> which I wouldn't have been able to do uh, being stuck inside this kind of realistic uh, realm. Um, and it really helped towards the end of the game where there's this kind of real twist on the, on the story and things become a lot more dreamlike and surreal, which I'll come to later in the presentation. But <clears throat> just to sum up this point, I really felt like I learned that kind of realism isn't the holy grail for immersion. It's... It's, in fact, realism doesn't have anything to do with it. It's not the fidelity of the content that mattered at all to me. It was actually, it turned out that it was the message and experience that you betray through the content that really matters in terms of immersion. Um, so speaking of that content, I think I should really just quickly talk about um, how it was built to connect the story back to the environment. Um, and I think the best way to do this is just kind of show... Uh, an example scene from the original mod and show how it's built up and, and improved upon in the remake and some of the most important steps in the process in order to kind of build this connection back up. Um, so here we got a scene from the original mod in which the narrator references at several points in the story um, where he says he describes a shipwreck in the bay and the pollution that's been caused to the island and the damage done by it and also the various supplies that he's looted from it. Um, and it's a really good example of where the narrative details didn't match up to the visual details, where there's this kind of real disconnection between the auditory experience and the visual experience. Um, and it was also an area that, had, that ended up having a huge potential to expand upon the story just through the environment and just through this one narrative detail. Um, but first, the connection really starts at the, the beginning of the, of the the kind of building of this terrain, at least it did for me, because in my mind, this terrain is kind of like the stage in which the story takes place. So this, I, I like to th think of a certain, certain amount of things that, to do before I, well, while I'm uh, uh, designing the environment. So for me, I wanted to create something within the terrain that would be unique to this aspect of the story. Um, and in this case, I wanted it to kind of frame it within the story so that when they, when they talk about the shipwreck, they could identify it within the environment. Um, and not only that, but I wanted to expand upon the game experience as well. So I wanted to expand upon the idea of exploration and offer something that was interesting to explore. And I kind of came up with this idea of these huge uh, sand dunes that just stretched across the bay. Um, just 
to make it a lot more interesting to explore and just kind of give it a, the, the shipwreck, this new, unique identity when it eventually comes in. And this comes in in the next stage where you start to add in the details. And this is the stage where you really start connecting the story to the environment, or at least I did. Um, and as you can see in the, in the small corner there, you can see the, a picture of the uh, original scene from the mod. And you just have this kind of little trawler with a few boxes floating around it, which represent the pollution on the island. <clears throat> but here I've really tried to up the scale of the, of the scene, really try to make it a more poignant, dramatic aspect of the story, um, just so that the environment is really, uh, you know, it becomes an, a, an integral part of the story within the environment there. Um, but not only that, I just made sure that the details of this piece were actually consistent with the story as well, because this can be a real immersion breaker if you don't really think about these kind of, this depth within the, uh, the, the art of the environment. So in this case, um, it had to be a fairly recent wreck uh, in order for the pollution to still have a hold and for the supplies to still be salvageable. Um, but going beyond this, I actually just expanded upon this aspect of pollution um, to try and expand, add depth to the story. And I did this by just making the pollution caused by it just evident all over the island. So it infests the soil, the sand and the grass, and it's just everywhere. And it really emphasizes the, the, the feeling that this island is kind of this miserable place, this un, unpleasant place to inhabit. Um, and again, I just expanded upon this idea further by um, adding in other shipwrecks to the island, um, some of them more recent, and, but more importantly, some of them much, much older. Um, and what this does is just to suggest that, you know, that these shipwrecks, these kind of disasters have been plaguing the island for hundreds of years and it just adds adding depth to that one narrative detail um, and again it's just building upon this, uh, this idea that the island is this really cursed place um, and what these details do is just add consistency to support the reality of the game world the reality of the story and so it's, just, it's, it's more about building a past as well as a present um, which I think is a really important thing um, and finally, I just decided that uh, later on in the development to um, try and connect the protagonist to the island, the, the character that you're portraying in some way through the environment. And I started to add in all these little small details that connect to him um, that are randomized and just, just serve to reward the exploration aspect of the game. So every time you play it, you get slightly different objects spawn. Um, and these just serve to offer a connection to the protagonist's past. And these are just a few examples of some of the items that you can find just around the shipwreck area. So you've got like the Jaws of Life, a partially burnt car seat, and a defibrillator. These are all kind of slightly out of place, and they just serve to, to kind of link back to his past, to kind of like give you a glimpse into uh, this tragic event that led him here in the first place. Um, but there's also other details that are outside of this as well that kind of expand upon uh, the story that's not portrayed throughout the uh, the narrative itself. Uh, for example, in the lower left-hand corner here, you have like some burnt divorce papers and uh, foreclosure on a on a mortgage, um, and these kind of just serve to to kind of offer a slightly different interpretation of the story in the background behind it. Um, so, the reason for doing this is kind of to make the protagonist not just this presence on the island, so you're not just this person just floating around, but you're actually part of the, the history of the environment as well. It's kind of like making him part of the island itself. Um, and I think there's just, moving on from that just a little bit, I just want to talk about one, one other thing that I thought was really instrumental in, in kind of bringing the immersion of the game up to a, to a whole new level. Um, and it was something I almost missed. Um, as it, I was pretty much through the second level of the game. Um, and I was, the whole world, the, everything was really coming together. The story was really, really becoming connected to the environment. But there was this real invisible barrier, this real disconnection between the visual experience still. And I couldn't quite figure it out. And one day I had this screenshot open. And I was just kind of looking at it and just thinking, well, it looks fine. I can't really figure out what it is. And I picked up my mouse and I tried to move it around, this screenshot. And I was like, at first I was like, oh, okay, this is just caffeine deprivation. But um, 
it suddenly occurred to me that the reason I couldn't discern this between the actual game itself was that everything was just completely static. There was no feeling of dynamism in the world. There was no feeling that this was a living, breathing space. And this was really, I think, what would this last disconnection was, was being caused by. And so, hopefully this will work. Um, play video. Okay. Ah, here we go. Yeah, so I started to add in all these like little random elements to kind of really bring in this movement and this organic feeling to the world. So you've got this wind blowing and the grass blowing in the wind and you've got all these leaves being picked up by that and you've got the kind of clouds scrolling along the sky, you've got the, the water flowing into the bay, you've got um, the waves splashing against the shore, you've got mist uh, evaporating from the, from the water. You've got all these different elements that kind of create this this kind of real organic feel to the world. And it just makes it much more, it made it much more of a believable world. It just really, it really just jumped the immersion level up massively. Um, and it's just, I think it was such an important part of, of really making it the world, uh, this kind of believable place. So finally, there's just one last thing I think I should talk about. Um, and it's probably one of the more complex things that I, I use to tell the story within the game. And it's something that I call subliminal signposting. So subliminal signposting is just quite simply a way of using the environment to unconsciously guide the player through some of the more figurative aspects of the story, which are not directly conveyed through the narrative. Um, and the, most of these signposts can usually be symbolic in nature. You can use them to kind of navigate the player around the environment which is kind of the more traditional way to use subliminal signposts, so like using the aerial to guide the player in the right direction. But I've used them a lot more. I think a lot of better examples are some of the more symbolic ones, and these are used to kind of portray some of the, uh, some of the protagonist's kind of state of mind, his thought, his feelings, his memories and emotions, and really build upon the possibility of the island or parts of the island being kind of unreal or a delusion. Uh, of his imagination conjured up in a kind of fever or, or kind of a purgatory. Um, and I think this is most prevalent during the cave, caves level of the game, where the protagonist is kind of at this height of his delusion. He's broken his leg, he's got this infection, and he's been taking all these painkillers, and he's kind of reached this crescendo when he descends into the caves. And I really wanted to create here like some kind of subtle break from the physical reality of the previous levels, and kind of make it more of a symbolic journey through his own body, his own mind, um, and his inner psyche. And just as, because he, it's, it's the turning point in the game where he kind of comes to terms with the events that happen, um, which I thought was really fitting. So as a result, there were really, number, there were really quite a number of uh, prominent subliminal signposts here. Um, and so... For example, in this, in this level, in the, one of the first scenes you come across, one of the first rooms you come across is this room here. And this is just really representative of his heart, which is one of the most important things of the story. It's the motion, it's the, it's the turmoil. Um, and it wasn't supposed to be represented in any kind of literal sense or physical sense. It's just there to serve to make an impression. So there's, there's, there's this kind of like very loose colors. There's the colors, the shapes, and everything like that are really designed to just bring this impression across. And I think in this case, I chose this one because it's a little bit more literal. If you focus on the blue colors uh, in the scene, you get this kind of very loose blue outline of this kind of heart shape. Um, but later on, it can be even, even more subtle than that. Um, and you've got other areas such as this. This kind of is towards the end of the caves level where you kind of go into this cave and there's all these writings and stuff around the walls. And this is really symbolic of his kind of inability to figure out the events that happened, this, this kind of fractured state of mind that led him here and his kind of tormented mind and the infection and various other things. And it all leads up to this, this probably most poignant scene in the game, which is kind of like a mix between uh, the kind of literal signposting and the, sub, the symbolic signposting. I mean, it's literal in the case that you've got this kind of, it's hard to see here, but it's just like this car wreck. Um, but it's symbolic in the fact that it's submerged beneath the bottom of the ocean, and it looks like it's been submerged for decades. And it's kind of representative of his kind of uh, 
repressed memories of this, is this event and is coming to terms with these memories. So it's a good example of where the environment can kind of really represent these kind of thoughts and feelings. And I think the last really strong image comes uh, at the end of the caves level when you're exiting out and you're exiting to, into the next level. Um, and this whole room is just designed to look like this giant eye and you're going through the iris of this eye. And it's, it's, you know, again, it's not, not completely literal, but in this case, it's, it's kind of been more literal. But it's, it's very symbolic of this kind of exit of the, uh, of the inner psyche and back into some kind of reality. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, I didn't want to create this kind of like really surreal, like literal representation of all these things in a level. I didn't want to do kind of a Max Payne event where you're following a trail of blood around. I still wanted to maintain the reality of the game world that I built up. So doing it in a subtle way really kind of just creates this uh, idea that the people can interpret it however they want. They might take something else away with, with it, and they might just think it's a case. But at the end of the day, it's, kind of, it's a nice way to communicate the emotional aspects of the story. So yeah, just to conclude, um, I, I really believe that choosing an art style shouldn't really be an aesthetic choice should really be a choice of being able to define your experience and support the goals within that experience. And it can also open up opportunities for you to communicate with your audience in new and interesting ways. Um, and in this case, choosing the impressionistic style really allowed me to express the uh, unreal and the surreal aspects of the story and really play with, with that within the environment. But not only that, but it's, it's not just about creating a physical landscape. Uh, for me, it's also about creating an emotional space in which the player can navigate and using that space to really define the experience. Um, so all these details, the small, the large, the, the, the literal, the figurative, um, are really the, the, the glue that adds depth to the story and the environment and uh, really helps to create this immersive world that's full of mystery just waiting to be explored. Um, and if there's any questions, hopefully I've got time. Um, thank you.